The events of the next few minutes are difficult for me now to sort out. I found it more difficult still at the time. All we heard back there in the sidings was a distant cheer, confused crackle of rifle fire, yells, heavy shelling on our front line, more shouts and yells, and a continuous rattle of machine guns. After a few minutes, lightly wounded men of the Middlesex came stumbling down to the dressing station. I stood at the junction of the siding and the alley. Among the wounded were a number of men yellow-faced and choking, their buttons tarnished green gas cases. Then came the badly wounded. The alley being narrow, the stretchers had difficulty in getting down. The Germans started shelling it with 5.9s. Thomas went back to battalion headquarters through the shelling to ask for orders. This cluster of dugouts in the reserve line showed very plainly from the air as battalion headquarters and should never have been occupied during a battle. Just before Thomas arrived, the Germans put five shells into it. The adjutant jumped one way, the colonel another. One shell went into the signals dug out, killed some signalers and destroyed the telephone. The colonel, slightly cut on the hand, joined the stream of wounded and was carried back as far as the base with it. The adjutant took command. Meanwhile, A and C Company had been waiting in the siding for the rum to arrive. The tradition of every attack being a double tot of rum beforehand. We fixed bayonets in readiness to go up and attack as soon as Captain Thomas returned with orders. Hundreds of wounded streamed by. At that moment, the storeman arrived, without rifle or equipment, hugging the rum bottle, red-faced and retching. He staggered up to the actor and said, There you are, sir, then fell on his face in the thick mud of a sump pit at the junction of the trench and the siding. The stopper of the bottle flew out, and what remained of the three gallons bubbled on the ground. The actor made no reply. This was a crime that deserved the death penalty. He put one foot on the storeman's neck, the other in the small of his back, and trod him into the mud. Then he gave the order, Company forward. The company advanced with a clatter of steel, and that was the last I ever heard of the storeman. It seems that at half past four, a captain commanding the gas company in the front line phoned through to divisional headquarters. Dead calm. Impossible discharge accessory. The answer he got was, accessory to be discharged at all costs. Thomas had not overestimated the gas company's efficiency. The spanners for unscrewing the cocks of the cylinders proved, with two or three exceptions, to be misfits. The gas men rushed about shouting for the loan of an adjustable spanner. They managed to discharge one or two cylinders. The gas went whistling out, formed a thick cloud a few yards off in no man's land, and then gradually spread back into our trenches. The Germans, who had been expecting gas, immediately put on their gas helmets, semi-rigid ones, better than ours. Bundles of oily cotton waste were strewn along the German parapet and set alight as a barrier to the gas. Then their batteries opened on our lines. The confusion in the front trench must have been horrible. Direct hits broke several of the gas cylinders, the trench filled with gas, the gas company stampeded. No orders could come through because the shell in the signals dugout at battalion headquarters had cut communication not only between companies and battalion, but between battalion and division. The officers in the front trench had to decide on immediate action. So two companies of the Middlesex, instead of waiting for the intense bombardment which would follow the advertised 40 minutes of gas, charged at once and got as far as the German wire which our artillery had not yet cut. So far, it had been treated only with shrapnel, which had no effect on it. The barbed wire needed high explosive and plenty of it. The Germans shot the Middlesex men down. One platoon is said to have found a gap and got into the German trench. But there were no survivors of the platoon to confirm this. 
two companies, instead of charging at once, rushed back out of the gas-filled assault trench to the support line and attacked from there. It will be recalled that the trench system had been pushed forward nearer the enemy in preparation for the battle. These companies were therefore attacking from the old front line, but the barbed wire entanglements protecting it had not been removed, so that the Highlanders got caught and machine-gunned between their own assault and support lines. The other two companies were equally unsuccessful. The survivors of the two leading Middlesex companies now lay in shell craters close to the German wire, sniping and making the Germans keep their heads down. They had bombs to throw, but these were nearly all of a new type issued for the battle. The fuses were lighted on the matchbox principle, and the rain had made them useless. The other two companies of the middle sex soon followed in support. Machine gun fire stopped them halfway. Only one German machine gun remained in action, the others having been knocked out by rifle or trench mortar fire. The company commander was known as The Boy. He had 20 years' service with the Middlesex, the Middlesex colonel when instructed to supply an officer for the Brigade Trench Mortar Company, sent for a full lieutenant nicknamed Jamaica. Jamaica held the responsible position of Brigade Mortar Officer. When the Middlesex charged, the boy fell mortally wounded as he climbed over the parapet. He tumbled back and began crawling down the trench to the stretcher bearers dug out, past Jamaica's trench mortar emplacement. Jamaica had lost his gun team and was boldly serving the trench mortars himself. On seeing the boy, however, he deserted his post and ran off to fetch a stretcher party. At this point, the Royal Welch Fusiliers came up the alley. The Germans were shelling it with five nines. This caused a continual scramble backwards and forwards, to cries of, Come on! And get back, you bastards! Gas turning on us! Keep your heads, you men! What's happening? Gas! 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 Wounded men and stretcher bearers kept trying to squeeze past. We were alternately putting on and taking off our gas helmets, which made things worse. In many places, the trench had caved in, obliging us to scramble over the top. Freeman reached the front line with only 50 men of B Company. The rest had lost their way in some abandoned trenches halfway up. The adjutant met him in the support line. Ready to go over Freeman? he asked. Freeman had to admit that he had lost most of his company. He felt this disgrace keenly. It was the first time that he had commanded a company in battle. Deciding to go over with his fifty men in support of the Middlesex, he blew his whistle and the company charged. They were stopped by machine gun fire before they had got through our own entanglements. Freeman himself died, oddly enough, of heart failure, as he stood on the parapet. A few minutes later, Captain Sampson, with C Company, and the remainder of B Company, reached our front line. Finding the gas cylinders still whistling and the trench full of dying men, he decided to go over too. He could not have it said that the Royal Welch had let down the Middlesex. A strong, comradely feeling bound the Middlesex and the Royal Welch, intensified by the accident that the other three battalions in the brigade were Scottish, and that our Scottish brigadier was, unjustly no doubt, accused of favouring them. One of the sea officers told me later what happened. It had been agreed to advance by platoon rushes with supporting fire. When his platoon had gone about twenty yards, he signalled them to lie down and open covering fire. The din was tremendous. He saw the platoon on his left flopping down too, so he whistled the advance again. Nobody seemed to hear. He jumped up from his shell hole waved and signalled forward. Nobody stirred. He shouted, You bloody cowards! Are you leaving me to go on alone? His platoon sergeant, groaning with a broken shoulder, gasped. Not cowards, sir. Willing enough. But they're all dead. The Pope's nose machine gun, traversing, had caught them as they rose to the whistle. 
I found myself with the actor in a narrow communication trench between the front and support lines. This trench had not been built wide enough for a stretcher to pass the bends. We came on, the boy lying on his stretcher, wounded in the lungs and stomach. Jamaica was standing over him in tears, blubbering. Poor old boy, poor old boy, he's going to die. I'm sure he is. He's the only one who treated me decently. The actor, finding that we could not get by, said to Jamaica, Take that poor sod out of the way, will you? I've got to get my company up. We went up to the corpse-strewn front line. The captain of the gas company, who was keeping his head and wore a special oxygen respirator, had by now turned off the gas cocks. Sprayers had cleared out most of the gas, but we were still warned to wear our masks. We climbed up and crouched on the fire step, where the gas was not so thick gas, being heavy stuff kept low. Then Thomas brought up the remainder of A and D Company, and we waited for the whistle to follow the other two companies over. Fortunately, at this moment, the adjutant appeared. He was now left in command of the battalion and told Thomas that he didn't care a damn about orders. He was going to cut his losses and not send A and D over to their deaths until he got definite orders from brigade. He had sent a runner back and we must wait. Meanwhile, the intense bombardment that was to follow the 40 minutes, discharge of gas began. It concentrated on the German front trench and wire. A good many shells fell short, and we had further casualties from them. In no man's land, the survivors of the middle sex and of our B and C companies suffered heavily. My mouth was dry, my eyes out of focus, and my legs quaking under me. I found a water bottle full of rum and drank about half a pint. It quieted me, and my head remained clear. Samson lay groaning about twenty yards beyond the front trench. Several attempts were made to rescue him. He had been very badly hit. Three men got killed in these attempts. Two officers and two men, wounded. In the end, his own orderly managed to crawl out to him. Samson waved him back, saying that he was riddled through and not worth rescuing. He sent his apologies to the company for making such a noise. We waited a couple of hours for the order to charge. The men were silent and depressed. Only Sergeant Townsend was making feeble, bitter jokes about the good old British army muddling through and how he thanked God we still had a navy. I shared the rest of my rum with him and he cheered up a little. Finally, a runner arrived with a message that the attack had been postponed. My memory of that day is hazy. We spent it getting the wounded down to the dressing station, spraying the trenches and dugouts to get rid of the gas, and clearing away the earth where trenches were blocked. The trenches stank with a gas blood latrine smell. At dusk, we all went out to get in the wounded, leaving only sentries in the line. The first dead body I came upon was Samson's, hit in seventeen places. I found that he had forced his knuckles into his mouth to stop himself crying out and attracting any more men to their death. Major Swanson, the second in command of the Middlesex, came crawling in from the German wire. He seemed to be wounded in lungs, stomach and one leg. A Middlesex second lieutenant came back unhurt. Together we bandaged Swainson and got him into the trench and on a stretcher. He begged me to loosen his belt. I cut it with a bowie knife I had bought for use during the battle. I do not remember hearing a shot fired that night, though we kept on until it was nearly dawn and we could see plainly. Then they fired a few warning shots, and we gave it up. By this time we had recovered all the wounded, and most of the Royal Welch dead. I was surprised at some of the attitudes in which the dead stiffened. We had spent the day after the attack carrying the dead down for burial and cleaning the trench up as best we could. That night, the Middlesex held the line, while the Royal Welch carried all the unbroken gas cylinders along to a position on the left flank of the brigade, where they were to be used on the following night. 
This was worse than carrying the dead. The cylinders were cast iron, heavy. The men cursed and sulked. Only the officers knew of the proposed attack. The men must not be told until just beforehand. I felt like screaming. Rain was still pouring down, harder than ever. We knew definitely this time that ours would be only a diversion to help troops on our right make the real attack. The scheme was the same as before. At 4 p.m., gas would be discharged for 40 minutes, and after a quarter of an hour's bombardment, we should attack. I broke the news to the men about an hour before. They took it well. The relations of officers and men, and of senior and junior officers, had been very different in the excitement of battle. There had been no insubordination, but a greater freedom of speech, as though we were all drunk together. At 4 p.m. then, the gas went off again with a strong wind. The gas men had brought enough spanners this time. The Germans stayed absolutely silent. Flares went up from the reserve lines, and it looked as though all the men in the front trench were dead. The brigadier decided not to take too much for granted. After the bombardment, he sent out an officer and 25 men as a feeling patrol. The patrol reached the German wire. There came a burst of machine gun and rifle fire, and only two wounded men regained the trench. We waited on the fire step with fixed bayonets for the order to go over. My mind was a blank. We were told to hold ourselves in readiness to go over at dawn. No order came at dawn, and no more attacks were promised us after this. From the morning of September 24th to the night of October 3rd, I had in all eight hours of sleep. I kept myself awake and alive by drinking about a bottle of whiskey a day. I had never drunk it before, and have seldom drunk it since. It certainly helped me then. We had no blankets, great coats, or waterproof sheets, nor any time or material to build new shelters. The rain poured down. Every night we went out to fetch in the dead of the other battalions. The Germans continued indulgent, and we had few casualties. After the first day or two, the corpses swelled and stank. I vomited more than once while superintending the carrying. Those we could not get in from the German wire continued to swell until the wall of the stomach collapsed, either naturally or when punctured by a bullet. A disgusting smell would float across. The colour of the dead faces changed from white to yellow-grey, to red, to purple, to green, to black, to slimy. On the morning of the 27th, a cry arose from no man's land. A wounded soldier of the Middlesex had recovered consciousness after two days. He lay close to the German wire. Our men heard it and looked at each other. We had a tender-hearted lance corporal named Baxter. As soon as he heard the wounded Middlesex man, he ran along the trench, calling for a volunteer to help fetch him in. Of course, no one would go. It was death to put one's head over the parapet. When he came running to ask me, I excused myself as being the only officer in the company. I would come out with him at dusk. So he went alone. He jumped quickly over the parapet, then strolled across no man's land, waving a handkerchief. The Germans fired to frighten him, but since he persisted, they let him come up close. Baxter continued towards them, and when he got to the middle sex man, stopped and pointed to show the Germans what he was at. Then he dressed the man's wounds, gave him a drink of rum and some biscuit that he had with him, and promised to be back again at nightfall. He did come back with a stretcher party, and the man eventually recovered. I recommended Baxter for the Victoria Cross, being the only officer who had witnessed the action, but the authorities thought it worth no more than a Distinguished Conduct Medal.